with me is Fei Fei Li. Fei Fei's name has come up a lot already on our show, and for good reasons. She is the Sequoia Capital Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University, co-director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, and the Vision and Learning Lab. As her long Wikipedia page says, she was the leading scientist and instigator of ImageNet, which ultimately helped vision systems and neural nets to break through out of academia and into industries all over the world. Hey, hey, so happy to have you here with me. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's uh, quite a pleasure and honor to be invited to this. I, I wanted to do this with you for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say in many ways, I feel like I'm so lucky to finally ha have you on. Um, and in many ways, I feel you're overdue because actually, as you know, our episode one was one of your former students, Andre Karpathy. Episode two was one of your former students, Olga Rusikovsky. But now we're, you know, at the source <laughs> of it all. So very exciting. You start with the best. <laughs> <laughs> You're known for for so many things at this point, Fei Fei, um, including your you know now famous of their own uh, in their own right students and so forth. Um, but it didn't start out that way, um, as I understand it. I was I was reading up on you and listening to talks about, from you and about you uh, yesterday. Um, you actually didn't start as a Stanford professor. You started as working in a dry cleaner. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I um, in Silicon Valley language, that would be my startup. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. When I was, uh, I think, nineteen year old, I just started at Princeton for college, and uh, as a as a typical immigration family. Um, my parents and I were, you know, uh, needed needed to to find a way to survive, and uh, and I, um, given that, uh, you know, my parents didn't speak English and and all the constraints, um, I pretty much decided that a cleaning shop, a cleaner, dry cleaner shop, is the best way to go. Especially, it's a weekend business, and mm. I can do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of running the business and, and, and uh, uh, running the shop. So that, that's how it all started. <laughs> that's, that's so interesting. And uh, I, I like the notion like a weekend business. You're just like studying at Princeton during the week, getting your homework done. I, I imagine you did your homework based on where you got <laughs> by now. And then on the weekend, you're working at dry cleaners. Um, I'm just curious, if you look back at it, uh, do you see any uh, AI opportunities within the dry cleaning business? Absolutely, I didn't, Peter. I think uh, looking back at it, so, so, so there was a running theme. I, my first job wasn't dry cleaning. My, my first job was uh, Chinese restaurants. Um, I was uh, uh, in the kitchen working, oh. and, then, um, and then I did some home cleaning, and then I get into dry, uh, dry cleaning. Um, mm. I guess the running theme is that I didn't let that define me. I just mm. thought that is a necessary part of an immigrant life. You know, you have to do what is necessary to survive and, and, uh, and to make it in the society that was uh, still new to me, to my family. Mm -hmm. But what really did define me, even as early as that time, was my love for science, especially mm. at that time, physics. I, I, as you know, I majored in physics at Princeton. It's that mm. um, imagination and audacity to ask such fundamental questions of our universe. Um, mm. That did define me. And I do remember carrying books um, that... Um, you know, even in, in the Chinese restaurant or even in the, the dry cleaning shop, I would be reading okay. those books. So, oh, so wow. that was, uh, AI didn't come to that stage of my life yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. How did that transition happen? You're an undergrad at Princeton studying physics. So, so that happened in a very, very, um, both serendipitous and maybe intentional way. So I... I was obsessed with physics. And in fact, I still feel I'm more of a physicist scientist 
than an engineer. We can talk about that. What's the difference?、Mm-hmm. But I was really obsessed. So I was reading a lot of the books of the greatest twentieth century、uh, physicists. You know, of course, starting with Einstein, he remained my favorite、mm-hmm. scientist of all time. And then、uh, Schrodinger, and then actually someone, Roger Penrose, had been my childhood hero, but he only got a Nobel Prize last year. I was so happy.、Um, <laughs> but I was and Hawking, of course, and I was reading their books, and I noticed something I didn't expect. I noticed that Einstein, Schrodinger, Penrose, towards the later stage of their career, they Ask more questions inwards than outwards.、Mm. You know, outwards is about the boundary of the universe, the beginning of time, the 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 the, the sub 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 a、uh, uh, structure of atoms. But inwards is about who are we, what is、mm. life. In fact, Schrodinger has this book called "What Is Life," and and Penrose talk about minds, and that really hit a chord in me. Somehow, I follow their lead in a way. I feel like they almost feel like they're transitioning into those questions was the path I want to take. So I started to be very fascinated by the inward question instead of the outward question. And the inward question of what is life, what define life,、um, start to capture me around the middle of.、Um, College,、mm-hmm. and and trained as a physics student. If you wanna, if you're curious about something, you're driven to ask the most fundamental questions. And for me, the most fundamental question of life, especially life related to humans, is intelligence.、Mm-hmm. So I I took a very very um um purposeful dive. Into the world of neuroscience, I I I start I interned a couple of internship in neuroscience, and I realized, wow, I really really love the question of intelligence,、um, mm. and that's when I pivoted from,、um, you know, hardcore atomic world physics to、um, the pursuit of intelligence. That's so interesting, that. The the physicist books they write at towards the end of their career, when they converge on what they then find interesting, you jump right into it, get going there.、Um, I will say a lot of what drove me into AI、I、was also thinking about human intelligence, but I kind of quickly gave up on trying to understand neuroscience, and, and I thought engineering a solution might might be an easier way than than to try to measure things in the brain, but. As I understand it, you continue to study neuroscience still till today, but especially then, it sounds like it. So, how did that lead into your PhD? Yeah, so、um, so this is where Peter, we can dive in. Are we building airplane or are we building birds? Right. I, I think both the、right. scientific and engineering mindsets are so important for a field as deep and vast as AI. Personally, I got in because.、Um, I wanted to traverse the boundary between、um, how brain works as well as how artificial brain can work, and I think there is a little bit of a、um, leftover physics romance in me. There ought to be some unified theory, whether it's a silicon-based brain or a、uh, organic carbon-based brain.、Mm-hmm. Um, I. Would love to see till today. I would love to see some unifying principles. So I didn't have that、um, strong boundary between human intelligence and machine intelligence, and and I chose my PhD based on if I can set up an interdisciplinary graduate school program for、mm-hmm. myself.、Um, as you you were too, we had several choices. But what really worked was Caltech for me. I、uh, I got to、um, study under Christoph Koch, who was、mm-hmm. also a physicist, 
turned into a computational neuroscientist. And then Pietro Perona, who is an engineer, turned into an AI tech uh, researcher. And studying with them in that combination was really the best of both worlds for me. I was able to continue the cognitive and computational neuroscience work that I always loved. Mm -hmm. But it was really in Pietro's lab that I got to learn about what AI is about, what computer vision was about, and, um, and what machine learning as a mathematical tool can do. And I have to say, I just loved it so much. It's, um, I, I distinctively remember how much I felt in grad school, this field is the love of my life kind of feeling I, I i wonder if you had that but but once you have that you that's it right you you don't let go of that feeling <laughs> i think it's very interesting because it's um the feeling you're talking about I, I think i mean i don't know exactly what you're feeling of course but I, I get a similar sense of you work on something that can be so foundational and so fundamental that it, it's hard not to be excited about it pretty much every moment of every day because it's just yeah. well there's this possibility to really understand something deep to be able to build really impactful powerful uh new technologies that are just of a different generation than what we've built so far and it's it's hard to not be intrigued at all times at least for yeah. me yeah totally <laughs> that 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 feeling i i I guess it's not too dissimilar to kids discovering a new playground. There's endless surprises and treasures to dig out of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, what I think is, is really interesting, if we look at the evolution of AI and, and a lot of the um, things we've actually discussed in the podcast in past episodes, and I'm sure we'll discuss in the future, is that there is an obvious major inflection point in the evolution of AI, recent inflection point uh, in 2012. In 2012, there is the ImageNet slash AlexNet moment where deep neural networks break through. People were working on them modestly, people who believed in their potential working on them, but they hadn't shown their true capabilities till, till that moment. And, and, and that's when people, everybody woke up to the power of neural networks, not just the early, early believers. And of course, I mean, you're central to the story as central as it gets, because you came up with the ImageNet data set, ImageNet competition, which enabled training on this large vision data set. But of course, you didn't do that in 2012. That started earlier. So I'm really curious, what is the origins for you personally of building ImageNet? several years before that breakthrough actually happened, right? It started in grad school. You know, in grad school, one thing that's fascinating about my uh, the lab I worked at, which is uh, Pietro Perona's lab, was that um, it was one of the very first labs in the world of computer vision that's working on this seemingly impossible question of object uh, recognition. Because at that time, the world of computer vision was focusing more on stereo vision and epipolar geometry. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were working on this, this seemingly crazy topic of how do you teach a machine to recognize everyday objects? And the reason we wanted to work on it um, for Pietro and for me is actually a deeply neuroscience reason. Because if you look at the body of cognitive neuroscience and neurophysiology literature coming out of the 80s and 90s and, and early 21st century, there is, a, um, there is a moment in that field where it's showing us that the human brain and human mind is so... Um, wired evolutionarily to perform object recognition functionality in a profoundly robust way. And that is, to this day, what I would consider the kind of North Stars that, uh, that really guided um, um, a small group of computer vision scientists at that time, very small, like probably single digit number, Pietro being a central figure. Mm -hmm. And so my PhD was surrounding that object recognition problem. And on top of that, um, I think you and I 
belong to more or less the same generation of PhD student that we embrace machine learning. It was mm -hmm. a new-ish field, right? Combining statistical modeling and computer science. And we are looking at profound mathematical issues like generalization and, uh, and, 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 and how we can enable that kind of human capable generalization into machines. And towards the end of my PhD, my biggest frustration in the field of, in the area of object recognition is that we were hand tuning um, mostly Bayesian, BaseNet models in a very painful way because we, um, we don't know how to learn most of the, 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 the pixel world. So we hand engineered features to start with to make sure it captured the, 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 the corners, the slanted lines, the yellow, the, mm -hmm. the oriented edges, the, 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 the different shapes. That, that was one thing that we were hand engineering. The second thing we're hand engineering is the infinite combinatorial possibilities of combining these features in order to express an object, right? You can think mm -hmm. um, a cat that um, how many, you know, if you just pick, let's say 10 features that are, you know, parts of a year, parts of a face, parts of a body, and start mm -hmm. thinking about how we assemble them, that, that's infinite. And we were trying to use um, not very expressive models, mostly Gaussian models, um, to try to um, as assemble together a generalizable model. And that was just very painful. And that, that was the end of my PhD, even though we made some progress. So then I transitioned into um, uh, assistant professor 2005. And, um, and I was just thinking, you know, it, it, was, it dawned on me that one of the most important concepts in machine learning is to avoid overfitting to enable generalization, that, that they, they come as a couple. And um, if we want to avoid overfitting and to, to enable good generalization, we need powerful models. But mm -hmm. mathematically, if we need powerful models, we need enough data. Because if we don't have enough data, you, I mean, Peter, you know that, um, we will overfit the models very easily. So mm -hmm. I, I turned my attention to data following that line of thinking and realized there aren't that many data set uh, uh, you know, out there. In computer vision at that time, there was the Caltech 101, which was part of my dissertation, and then the mm -hmm. Pascal VOC, all in the realm of um, um, 10,000, 20,000 number of images. That is mm -hmm. tiny compared to the, the pix pixel possibilities. And in mm -hmm. the world of machine learning, I, I don't know if you you even remember the UC Irvine data set. Oh yeah. <laughs> remember how tiny that data set is? So mm -hmm. either if you look at the, the world of uh, NeurIPS, um, it had an older name at that, at that time, or the world of computer vision, we're working on tiny data sets. Mm -hmm. So around 2006, I, I pretty much told my student that we've got to reset this thinking and um, it, 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 it create a data set that is orders of magnitude different, not for the sake of size, but the, for the sake of rebooting machine learning. Hmm. Um, and that was really the, the, the beginning. How the image net come about? was a trip to Princeton. I was then in the middle of transitioning from um, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, back to my alma mater at Princeton. And I think one of those recruiting trips, they knew I liked psychology. They actually were giving me a courtesy appointment at psychology mm -hmm. department. And I got to talk to a couple of linguists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of them was a, a professor called uh, Christiane Felbum. And I actually, at the beginning, didn't know why I was talking to linguists <laughs> coming from the world of computer vision. But they, um, 
it turned out they were they were the 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 center of the WordNet world, and right. they they learned I was giving semantic labels to objects, you know, in object recognition, and they wanted to see if there's a link between language and and vision. That was really ahead of thinking. I wasn't thinking mm-hmm. deeply about language at all at that time, and but I heard about WordNet. That was a moment. I really I felt. Oh my God! This is the backbone of the data set that I will be making. The backbone is all the nouns in WordNet. At that time, I thought it was eighty thousand, eighty thousand nouns in WordNet, and we will create a ginormous data set based on this backbone. And and I did have that belief; it will change the world of computer vision and machine learning、um, because of the scale and the the the、um, the the definitive north star we can put forward for for the field. So that was really the the beginning of when ImageNet idea came about was two thousand six. In in a in a trip before I moved to Princeton. Wow, I didn't know that story. That's really interesting, Fefe. Now I'm curious. You want to build a data set, an image recognition data set, with eighty thousand possible labels. Apparently, the number of words in in WordNet. Number of nouns. Number of nouns. Sorry, number of nouns in in WordNet, and compare that to existing data sets. I mean, Caltech one hundred and one had one hundred and one. Classification levels. That's very different from eighty thousand. So clearly, it's going to be a different kind of scale effort to、uh, to pull this off. How, how do you how do you do it? So sometimes I look back and I think,、um, if I knew all the problem we would run into, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know if we would have started. You know, way it's some naivety that that drove us into it. So I had this naive idea that we will download. That can be done. We download from the internet,、uh, following search engine leads,、mm. but we will hire undergrad to clean. That was、mm. really my. I I don't know why that was my plan. I I thought that you know undergrads are abundant and great, so、mm-hmm. we started that journey. We um you know we had to download um literally billions of images because.、Mm-hmm. Uh, compared to today's search engine, that time search engine quality was way worse. So the, the the you know even if you type in the word German Shepherd, the the quality of images were really not great. On top、mm-hmm. of that, as you know, Peter, the most important thing about a training dataset is diversity and variability. So you cannot、mm-hmm. just type in German Shepherd. We had to do automatic word completion like. German Shepherd playing frisbee. German Shepherd in by a beach. German Shepherd, you know,、uh, or or German Shepherd puppies, you know, to to really make the search result rich. But it's also extremely noisy. So I thought that at the cost of ten hours, ten dollars per hour, I will hire hundreds and hundreds of undergrads and just、mm-hmm. sitting.、Uh, by that time, I was at Princeton, Princeton、mm-hmm. Lab, and 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 just label it.、Um, mm-hmm. Frankly, I had that naivety. I think because Caltech one hundred and one, that's what I did myself. <laughs> so, so I thought maybe, but I forgot the scale. You know, Caltech one hundred and one was just ten、uh, thousand、um, pictures that was manageable. But I totally didn't think deeply about the scale. Um, um, But after you know a few months, it was just impossible. My、um, my PhD student at that time, who、uh, um, who's working on、uh, image that is called Jia Dan, who is now a professor in AI,、mm-hmm. and he was just getting less and less happy about this whole situation. <laughs> so we pivoted drastically to the other end of the extreme. We pivoted pivoted to machine selection. We decided humans are impossible. Let's just use machines to select. I don't know if you remember, Peter. There's a whole、um, few years where topic models,、mm-hmm. you know,、uh, Dirichlet allocation、right. models、mm-hmm. and 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 latent、um, 
um, you know, uh, the racially allocation models um, were really, really um, prominent. And we thought that we'll use that kind of, it's basically a clustering al algorithm, the mm -hmm. kind of clustering algorithm to, to select good clus clusters of, say, German mm -hmm. shepherds. And then we'll, we'll, but two things dawned on us. One, machines are not perfect. So mm -hmm. you'll still deal with noise, but we thought, okay, that's doable. We can just use humans to, uh, to do some refined labeling. But mm -hmm. the other thing that dawned on us, again, I, I felt I was just slow. It should have dawned on me before we got started. It was the philosophical problem of if you use machines to select, you're already biased for, for mm -hmm. machines and biased towards that algorithm you used mm -hmm. to select the pictures in the first place. And that was not what we wanted. We still believe we have to establish a North Star, a North Star of human quality object mm -hmm. recognition. So we got rid of the two extreme. You know, we couldn't do the undergrads. We couldn't do the machines. And then we were stuck till a master's student coming from Stanford at that time at Princeton mentioned to me in the hallway early mm -hmm. 2007, I still remember, he said, Feifei, have you heard of a thing called Amazon Mechanical Turk? Mm -hmm. And I did not. I really didn't. And I went back that afternoon or evening at home. I logged on. And that moment, I knew image that would happen. I, when I look at Amazon Mechanical Turk, the online uh, workers market, mm -hmm. where you can deploy massive amount of tasks and pay people worldwide to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I've never thought of such a thing. I've never seen such a thing. And that platform of scale solved our problem. It was still a two and a half year journey mm -hmm. after that moment to get ImageNet, you know, a lot of engineering. We were the early adapters of AMT and all that. Mm -hmm. But it was just an incredible technological moment that I still remember the feeling of, oh my God, I had no idea this existed and this is the path towards completing ImageNet. And I think it's so interesting, the path you describe, really hard path to follow then and to get it done. And then today, of course, Amazon Mechanical Turk is this massive, massive business. And even just labeling images in itself, there is multiple companies, including multi-billion dollar companies, where exactly. all they do effectively is you can ship your images and they'll find somebody to, to annotate them for you. So it's, it's become what you did there has become a many billion dollar business for many, many companies throughout the world, which is, which is so interesting. And what, you know, and at the first time around, it's so hard to do. Now it's completely commercialized 14, 15 years later. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is great to see that it's, you know, of course, we didn't expect that, <laughs> but um, it's an incredible convergence of history of technology mm -hmm. to, to get us from there to here. Now, one thing I find really interesting in the history of ImageNet is, of course, and most people know, know really well as the AlexNet moment, ImageNet competition in 2012. And I think it's so interesting because... I mean, it completely changed what everybody is, is working on. Um, but I'm really curious because everybody switched to deep learning after, after that result, the breakthrough in image recognition. Um, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, though, you're running ImageNet competition probably for the third or fourth time? Third, third year. Third time? Yeah. Well, how, how is it? I mean, in the first and second year, there was no such like event that changed it. The world of AI, obviously, is that there, how was that for you? How did that play out? Yeah, so 2009 was our CVPR uh, poster paper releasing ImageNet. We immediately got a lot of criticism. Actually, I got more criticism than, than any endorsement. Uh, most of the oh. criticism were um, we haven't even solved, you know, a handful of object 
recognition. Why are you releasing a data set of 22,000 categories? Um, mm -hmm. Are you just comparing bigger is better? What is the intellectual depth of this? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who cares about labeled images? So there was a lot of criticism. Um, luckily, I guess we didn't really um, care in a sense we we knew why ImageNet was made we knew the north star of um computer vision one of them was what ImageNet would be uh, you know driving towards um but we did want to democratize this right as as you know in the world of research um we want to make impactful work through democratizing our ideas um, mm -hmm. And we learned uh, a page from Pascal VOC challenge team that running a, a, a well curated challenge would be a good way to democratize this idea. And I'm really grateful that the Pascal team actually was really, they understood us. They were very kind to us. You know, they said, okay, this is a lot of work, and which was true. You might not know what you're doing. Why don't you do a, um, a, a, a track, a teaser challenge with us in 2010 to just get your uh, feet mm -hmm. wet? And I was happy to do that. I was very grateful that Pascal even embraced us. So uh, 2010, you know, um, not much happened. You know, the number of participants were were small, and it was just a, a refined as as SVM model, support vector machine model that won that year's challenge. And then um, 2011 was even fewer people. So 2011, we decided we could do a st standalone challenge. Um, so, but it was like single digit number of teams participated <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was you know the biggest problem for everybody at that time was the size of compute you cannot even fit data into memory that was it wasn't even algorithm necessarily it was size of compute and we heard that and uh we um one thing I learned, I, I, I'm trying to attribute who taught me that, but I learned in grad school, Peter, was to believe in Moore's law. Uh -huh. I, I learned that in the world of computer, especially um, machine learning research, believe the trend of um, smaller and smaller memory and faster and faster uh, compute. Um, in a way, I guess I learned not to outsmart Moore's law, you know, go along the trajectory of Moore's law. So I remember telling myself, it's okay, it'll take a few years. I didn't think it would take only 12 months in uh, mm -hmm. 2011. It'll take a few years, but the chips are getting large, uh, memories are getting larger and chips are getting faster. And of course, 2012, I, I was trying to reconstruct if I, I think I either received a phone call or an email late at night after the image that challenge was released and the results came in from, um, um, from my student, Oga and Ja, and said, we have an unbelievable entry that won this year's, um, that won this year's challenge. And the most shocking thing about that entry was that it was a known algorithm for almost 30 years. Uh -huh. It was convolutional neural network. I, I mean, Peter, did you, I, that was my first class in the grad school was neural network. It, it was, you know, we were all in the world of Bayesian modeling, Bayes net. Mm -hmm. I did not expect convolutional neural network as a, a fairly old model in the world of uh, Machine mm -hmm. learning to um, to win that uh, to win that challenge, and we immediately. Um, I remember I was still on maternity leave, but I was just too excited. <laughs> I, I did two things. One is, of course, immediately try to understand what's new. At that time, I remember the dropouts and the mm -hmm. Relu, uh, mm -hmm. the, the 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 two more or less two innovation. Of course, GPU was a big deal, right? There were two, mm -hmm. Alex used two GPUs. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that was one thing. The second thing is that um, 
it was very late, but I had to book a ticket to、um, Florence, Italy, because the winner, the workshop for Image That Challenge would be would be held at ICCV Florence, Italy, and I was、mm-hmm. not gonna go. I I thought I would just stay home, you know, still、mm-hmm. on my maternity leave. But it was so significant,、mm-hmm. and and I I had no doubt it was a historical result that I had to go and.、Uh, Thanks to the late,、uh, late、um, outcome, I, I had to squeeze in the middle seat. <laughs> I was really unhappy about that. I remembered、um, I was in the air back and forth longer than I was in Florence, Italy.、Oh, wow. <laughs> But it was a very, very memorable, memorable moment in in all of our career. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, I was not attending computer vision conferences. At the time, I mean, the fields were further apart. If you worked、yes. computer vision versus natural language processing versus machine learning, even which had you know participated in these, but was still separate. Robotics was separate, even though today it, it, it's so weird to imagine that those were all separate because the tools are so shared. Back then, they were quite distinct communities.、Um, but despite not being in the computer vision community. The word propagated very, very quickly. <laughs> that something happened there. What did you hear?、Um, well, for me, it was Jitendra Malik, my colleague at Berkeley, of course, he, telling the story.、Um, uh-huh. Yeah. So he, you know, because I mean, he 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 was one of the people, maybe I'm probably the person who challenged Jeff Hinton to try out neural networks on ImageNet、um, you know, over a phone call. So that's how Jitendra tells the story. Is that you know. You know, Jeff you know. Him up. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, first Jeff says,、uh, "I hear you, you're you're talking negatively about neural nets and and so forth." And Jatendra says, "Yes, I am." <laughs> and Jeff says, "Well, well, we'll convince you." <laughs> and Jatendra says, "Well, the, you know, one one option, of course, Jatendra tells the story better, but one option is if you show convincing results on ImageNet because that would be a real data set, like a real result. If you can do well on ImageNet." You've shown something on real-world data, hard problem. So, so Jatendra also played an outsized role in the creation of ImageNet. He、um, he publicly talks about this. That's why I can share it. So, so you know Jatendra is my academic grandfather,、mm-hmm. and、um, I think his research style has influenced me deeply because he really was the first person who combined that cognitive. Neuroscience psychology thinking into computer vision, which、mm-hmm. Pietro also embodied, and I inherited、uh, deeply because of Jatendra.、Mm-hmm. So, and also throughout my career, he's been just one of the most supportive. But、mm-hmm. when he heard in two thousand seven at CVPR, I was a really you know insecure assistant professor. Um, worried about tenure, funding, students, as as、mm-hmm. we all have been through, I told him about I was making ImageNet, <laughs> and、uh, Jatendra said, "Hmm, I'm not so sure this is good for your tenure." <laughs> 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 and、uh, and he had a good reason. He he said that、um, it's too much. What I was planning was really too much of a jump,、uh, you know, for for the field.、Uh, tens of thousands of categories and 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 tens of millions of images was just not what the field was there for, you know. Like we said, right? Even memories, even、mm-hmm. till two thousand eleven, you cannot find a chip powerful enough to fit the the data into memory, let alone doing、mm-hmm. computing.、Um, So, so it's.、Uh, I don't know how, why. I guess I I believed it so much and was naive enough that I didn't go. It's probably the only advice Jatendra gave me that I didn't follow, <laughs> and、uh, he's been so supportive, and we still joke about that moment till today. <laughs> We are dropping new interviews every week, so subscribe to the Robot Brains on whichever platform you listen to your podcasts. Now, one of the things that I think is really intriguing about what's been been happening in in your career, Fefe, is vision and more generally machine learning really took off 
after the ImageNet, AlexNet moment. But what it has also meant is that the application spectrum has grown. It used to be an academic endeavor. It's become a very, well, industrial endeavor, just as much as academic. You can build real applications, real things that can do something in the real world. And um, one of the things that, that is, I think, really amazing that, that's happened in your career recently is you were elected to the National Academy of Medicine. So how, how did that happen? I mean, you're an AI researcher, computer vision researcher, and you're in the National Academy of Medicine. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I believe there are other computational scientists, computer scientists in the Academy of Medicine. So, uh, so, so Peter, there's, you know, people know, uh, talk about lives on resumes, but there is a, a major part of my life that's not on my resume, but I would say that define who I am more than anything that's on my resume is um, taking care of my mom. She's... Mm chronically very, very ill, mostly due to a, 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 a half a century long severe cardiovascular heart problem. Mm. But she is, you know, without getting into all the details, um, ever since my teenagehood, especially coming to this country as the only person who speak um, English, eventually who spoke English in the family, I've taken care of her um, not only on a daily basis, but also on the basis of her healthcare manager. You know, I've been to every mm. single ER, every single surgery, every single ICU, every single hospital stay. I'm also her only child. And, um, and so it's been more than 30 years that my life um, is defined by everything that is related to my mom's health. I, I remember my final exams at Princeton were done by her surgery bed. I remember I had to postpone my PhD thesis defense because of, um, of her, you know, severe situation. Mm -hmm. I remember I had to um, select my jobs based on where, you know, for example, Northern California is a, a, good location for a person with severe heart disease. So, so mm -hmm. she, you know, I, I took her. All this is a long way of saying that healthcare and medicine has been in my life so deeply that right around AlexNet 2012, that deep learning takeoff happened. Um, I, I was wake woke, woke up with this really strong belief that the healthcare industry um, will be impacted by by AI and the reason I had that belief was um, concurrent with the deep learning revolution there was another revolution that's closer to your world Peter um, is the revolution of self-driving cars you know mm -hmm. in around that time self you know, coming out of Stanford, self-driving car was becoming commercial and companies from Google to other, uh, to many other companies um, was really starting to uh, industrialize uh, that whole concept. Mm -hmm. And what is the technological core of self-driving car is really, um, you know, in the moment contextual understanding of what's going mm -hmm. on with people and traffic, and 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 then the the data analytic to drive better decision making. As mm -hmm. someone who lives through the system of healthcare, this is exactly the same situation: complex human, um, multi-human workflow situation that is all geared towards better decision making for patients. And mm -hmm. and so I understood that industry so well, I wanted to do something with healthcare. So I started to shopping around my idea around Stanford, being a great medical school. And most people just like think I was crazy till, um, till I met uh, Professor Arnie Milstein. He was invited by the then president's 
uh, office of Stanford to start a clinical excellence research center. He was the professor of medicine and director of uh, what we call CERC. And he was exactly the researcher who's, who's put his entire career on looking at healthcare workflow and how to make patients safer, how to make clinicians um, decision-making and action safer. I didn't know before I met Arnie that more than 250,000 American patients die every year out of medical error. Mm -hmm. I didn't know wow. more than 90,000 patients die every year in America due to hospital acquired infection, mostly through lack of good hand hygiene practice. That's three wow. times more than the people killed on the road. Mm -hmm. These are staggering numbers. The need for safer patient care, the need for more clinician assistance to our overworked nurses and doctors is just tremendous. And once Arnie and I got together in 2012, we began this new line of research at that time was, you know, even till today, it's still fairly new is what we call ambient intelligence of using um, um, sensors you know, I, I, I hesitate to call them cameras because of privacy reason, we have to uh, use other kind of modality like depth and, and IR using sensors to understand human behavior like patients, clinicians, and then use that information to inform better uh, care delivery. And we've worked on that for um, nine years now. And um, we've worked on that in um, ICU settings for patient mobility. We work on that in um, senior homes for, for uh, understanding fall risk. We've worked on that in um, children's hospital at Stanford to assess uh, hand hygiene practice. So we, we work on different healthcare scenario. And I think that is, um, in my opinion, the most, one of the most humanitarian and benevolent, socially benevolent application of computer vision. It's amazing um, that we always hear the numbers about avoidable deaths in driving, but we don't hear so many, not as frequently the numbers you just quoted that, you know, there's even more preventable death in healthcare system. Um, now, Im imagine I walk to a Stanford hospital. Is there any place I could go and could see one of your systems in action? Yes, um, except I don't wish you or your loved ones being there. Um, okay. I see you. <laughs> I, see. Um, I see you as we speak. We are putting um, more than 100 sensors and conducting research right now about uh, patient safety and, and, and workflow. It used to be children's hospital also had sensors, but they were renovating the building, so they took down. But mm -hmm. now it's uh, the adult hospital ICU. And should I think of it as when you say monitor the workflow, does the system somehow have access to a description of what's supposed to happen with each patient and then somehow can monitor? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, Peter, at some point, that's the, the, the um, direction of this technology with the metadata from EHR, EMR, and, and other mm -hmm. uh, sensors. You can totally imagine there is that prior knowledge. Right mm -hmm. now is, uh, uh, is much more simple. There's a couple of scenarios. One is safety, you know, patient getting out of bed, patient hopefully patient not falling, but if they fall, you know, detecting that those are um, um, fairly human behavior uh, 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 oriented. As you know, Peter, as a researcher, human behavior is extremely nuanced and complex. Oh, and, yeah. and this requires very um, deep understand uh, computer vision knowledge to do it. And, and fall is just one category of, um, of uh, um, um, behavior. I'm actually personally more excited in um, um, aging population care at home because hmm. the world is a lot more, um, you know, we, in a good news, we, we have longer lifespan. So the world is aging. And this past pandemic has also shown us that um, uh, that 
care at home is critical. And also in a situation like uh, in a situation like a global pandemic, a lot of elders are stuck at home. Their mm -hmm. other illnesses like dementia or you know COPD or um, diabetic management are being mm -hmm. disrupted. And how do we take care of patients and elderly at home? Is, is a huge open question. We call it the dark space of healthcare mm -hmm. because we don't know what's going on. Clinicians tell me everything clinically important happens in between visits, doctor's visits. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with this kind of technology, the ambient intelligence technology, um, but you know, fundamentally respects privacy, um, We'll be able to have a pair of guardian angel eyes to to um, watch in a in a in a positive way um, to take care of our um, our patients and elderly. So it's not just hospital. I, I really hope this can go to homes. I think that would be amazing. What I really like in in the whole story you're you're sharing here, Fefe, is you really want to take the best possible care of your mom. And, and you're doing that. And in the process, you're trying to build something that can you know, benefit so many other people across the world who might encounter sim similar situations. And this, of course, then reminds me of your other big current initiative, which is the Stanford Human Centered AI Institute, which is really focused on how AI is becoming real, not just a research thing anymore, and not just in medicine, but in so many places. AI is becoming very effective at helping solve problems, but sometimes also cause problems, obviously. And so I'm really curious, what, what, how would you describe what the Stanford High Institute is about? And how, how did you even decide to do it? Thank you, Peter, for asking that. Um, it is when I'm not doing research, um, which I'm very excited about, I, I, I'm working at uh, Stanford High. So, um, Stafford High is really a recognition, and I, I believe a lot of uh, institutions and, and, and centers in the world are recognizing that, is that AI is, is not only here to stay, AI is here to transform our lives and our industry and our business. There's no turning back. This technology is so horizontal and so powerful that some people call it the driving force of fourth industrial revolution or the digital revolution, whatever you call mm -hmm. it, it is so impactful for human lives. I had a um, also a front seat uh, view of that um, at Google when I did my sabbatical in 2017 and 2018 as the chief scientist of Google Cloud working with en enterprise businesses. And there we see every vertical business, um, whether you're talking about agriculture, healthcare, financial institute, um, whatever you name it, is being deeply impacted by data, machine learning, AI. So that coming back, finishing my sabbatical, coming back to Stanford, that realization and that experience um, was so profoundly impactful to me that I started talking to my colleagues and the, the leadership of Stanford and, and really posing it as a question, what is higher education and academia's historical role in this age? You know, what is our role in, um, in impacting humanity's future? We've always prided ourselves in educating tomorrow's leaders and workforce, but also um, becoming um, beacons of light in guiding um, thought, thoughts and scholarship mm -hmm. towards, towards a future we want. So what is Stanford's role? And I, it, it was really obvious to us that Stanford being, um, um, sorry for all my Stanford pride, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> at least you come from Stanford. <laughs> Stanford being one of the um, major centers of technology and, and, and AI field, we really have, we feel an outsized responsibility and opportunity to, to lead that thought leadership 
uh, um, practice. So HAI was was really founded on that mission to to better human condition through advanced AI research, education, and policy. And one of the most important recognition, actually, in the past few years, I don't know if you feel the same, is really the need to work with policy world. You know, technology is impacting human lives, and you said that in both positive and negative ways, right? Whether it's fairness, privacy, um, mm -hmm. state surveillance, it, all these um, are can be, uh, and also, of course, future of work, can be severely negative to 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 citizens and and community. In the meantime, healthcare, transportation, you know, we're, we're also making lives better. So it's really important to to have this bilateral conversation between the technology world and the policy world, and we're lacking that. Maybe it's California is just very far from DC, but we should bridge that gap. So HAI has this dual mission, both in terms of technological and interdisciplinary research innovation, but also the, the, the policy engagement, policy research, policy education, so that the two important worlds of technology and policymaking can be bridged and, and, and we create a forum for that. So that is what HAI's overall mission and, and our job is about. No, that, that's so intriguing as, as you as you explain that, Faith. And now when I think about bringing in policy, personally, I think about bringing policy into AI and research in, in general, I think it's what you said is, is on one hand easy, easy to see. And, and I agree, it's very important that, you know, whenever we make decisions that affect more than just ourselves, build systems that affect more than just ourselves, well, we're a society, we're part of a society, and we want to have, you know, as a society together decide how that's going to play out. The, the flip side of that, some people might, might say, and, and it's definitely at times on my mind, is that once policy and regulation get involved, it might slow down the progression. And maybe, you know, if there is too much policy and regulation in one place, then a place that has less can make faster progress and get further. And I'm curious about, about your thoughts on that, because it, you know, it seems like it could also go that way at some point, right? Yeah, absolutely, um, Peter. I think uh, this is why it's so complex. I, I think anything taken to the extreme is unlikely going to be optimal, right? So, so uh, guardrails and, and regulatory measures and, and, and owning will, without boosting the ecosystem, will probably uh, have a, a, a negative impact to, um, to innovation. So, mm -hmm. so here I, I, I want to mention two things. One is that I, uh, I emphasize on the, world, um, uh, on the word America's ecosystem. If you look at America in the past uh, more than half a century, it's just a, both of us are immigrants. We mm -hmm. don't see any other part of the world that has this incredible innovative ecosystem mm -hmm. that is at the interplay between um, industry, academia, uh, and uh, and federally funded, uh, you know, uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And this has shifted to the negative for academia to a large extent since the AI uh, industrialization. That the massive amount of resources from computing to data to talents are shifted to the industry. Mm -hmm. It has some positivity for sure, but it's the balance is tipped so much that at least those of us in academia, we worry about the brain drain, we worry about the next uh, future generation, and we also worry about blue sky research that is so important. Everything we know from convolutional neural network to um, image that still had some roots in academia, mm -hmm. even though, of course, uh, uh, at and Bell Labs also had uh, a, a big mm -hmm. role to play. So, um, so this is why HAI spent a bulk of 2020 um, helping to legislate an important bill called the National Research uh, uh, Cloud Task Force Bill that was passed January 1st this year. And now Biden administration had um, established a... Um, 
a um, um, task force answer to Congress on what we call national resource uh, national research resource uh, task force, focusing on how we can re reboot or reboost America's ecosystem in uh, in AI innovation, AI related innovation. So from that point of view, policy is not just about regulatory policy is also about incentive and resource allocation. And uh, HAI truly, truly believes in that. In fact, we we led that whole legislation effort together with a lot of universities and companies. Um, in the meantime, um, I also do believe technologists and technology world need to take a, a deep look at what regulatory measures mean. Um, I happen to be the one who believes some slowing down is not, is globally important. For example, hmm. in the beginning of cars, seatbelt was very controversial. You know, putting on seatbelt, requiring seatbelt was a slowing down. You know, it, 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 it's a slowing down of uh, driving, but, uh, but uh, um, it was important for saving lives. And we, we need that kind of slow, slowing down. And the industry I work most closely is healthcare. It's heavily, heavily regulated, you know, to the, mm -hmm. to the extent sometimes I feel frustrated. But if you look deep into the motivation of that regulation, it's so important. The, the challenge to us is that how we can continue to innovate and optimize that process so that it keeps life safe and, and distribution of, um, of technology fair uh, without dampening the, the, the speed of innovation. But I do think it's important that we have regula uh, regulations. Well, I mean, definitely regulations help us in many ways. Um, I wanna go back to the, to the task force actually, because I'm really curious about that. I haven't heard much about it yet. I've just seen a few announcements here and there, but you're, you're at the heart of it. So I'm really curious. Um, I saw this note, National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource Task Force, and that comes out of the bill that you helped get passed uh, about a half year ago. And, and I'm really curious, what are some of the hopes you have that this task force can, can achieve? When we started working on this bill, it was those data that, you know, coming out of our study that shows that um, the ac academia is so strained and, 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 and deprived of resource in the AI compute era. That was extremely alarming. If you look at, you know, any measure, whether it's uh, um, the GPU or, or just compute necessary for, for AI research or where today's students and also professors are going, um, the talent flow, we recognize that academia is draining and also um, impactful research is happening more and more in the walls of for-profit companies. There's nothing wrong with them um, investing in their R&D, but blue sky research and research for public good continues to be really important for the global um, uh, health of our economy. Um, and, and, and one good example is human, um, human genome project that was, uh, in the nineties, eighties and nineties, uh, 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 really quite a race between academia and, uh, industry. And, uh, eventually it was a, a drawing to win. And, uh, I remember it was President Clinton announcing human genome from his office with both uh, company and academia. And that really engendered so much, um, uh, you know, biology research and molecular research that uh, was, is important for disease treatment and drugs. Same thing for, for AI. Um, so if we go down to the core of what is missing or what is painfully um, impoverished in today's uh, academia, I would say, um, I would say um, compute and data are mm -hmm. two really important key factors. 
uh, at Berkeley and Stanford, I think we are very, very privileged and lucky researchers that we can um, apply for funding and have more or less um, necessary uh, resource, but this is not true for the greater academia. And uh, the National AI Research Resource will look deeply into um, how, if it's possible to collaborate with stakeholders to create the, the, the compute and data resource for generations of mm -hmm. uh, AI research that is not reliant um, um, very limited industry support, uh, uh, you know, for for the for the academia researchers, and also will focus on education, educating students from all over the country. So we definitely will be looking closely um, on how to establish that platform so that we can enable um, enable the most uh, creative and diverse uh, research. I really love this initiative, and I've. And one thing that's been on my mind, uh, sometimes people write about, oh, are the smartest people still going to come to the U.S.? You know, do they like to stay at home now instead of like us? We, we came to U.S. because, you know, more opportunity to do something big. It seems like something like this initiative, hopefully this initiative itself, um, could actually help a lot, right? Because if, if I think if a student gets to choose between a Ph.D. program in AI, in another country that is like it is today, or they come to US or they're already in US and then stay in, in US as opposed to going elsewhere because they get access to very large compute resources during their PhD, it seems like an easy decision that they'll be li likely, very likely more successful with access to the additional resources and have a lot of incentive to come do or continue to stay here for, for their PhDs. Um, which I think traditionally it's how it's been, right? I think the last, yeah. who knows how many years, people come to US for more, you know, be better PhD work they can do. I definitely see students, even after PhD at Stanford, leaving the US to Canada or Europe or, you know, other countries to become professors because of this lack of, I mean, it's many different reasons, but lack of resource would be one reason. So we need to, we need to reverse that. <laughs> I'm definitely seeing the same thing. I think it used to be people only go back if they really had very strong personal reasons to go back. But these days, it seems a lot of people feel like maybe they can do just as good work in the country they're from. It's not that big a difference anymore. And get, mm -hmm. getting that difference again would definitely affect the competitiveness we can, we can achieve here. Yeah. Um, so I'm really curious when you think about the future of AI in terms of applications, right? You've mentioned medicine as one of the, the big ones. Are there others that are maybe as close to your heart or maybe at least as important in your mind as AI for medicine that you'll see, you see happen in the next, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years? Yeah, uh, Peter, so this is where I feel insecure answering because I'm talking to the world's uh, greatest roboticist. <laughs> so it's closer to your world. Um, I am extremely excited by the world of robotics. As you said that 20 years ago, the world of robotics and AI were, was far further apart, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the tool sets and, and uh, the problems we work on. But now that with the um, emergence of um, uh, deep learning, machine learning, reinforcement learning, as well, I think as the, the maturation of computer vis vision, natural language processing, all this converged to a, in my opinion, um, very quickly going to be a watershed moment for, for robotic um, uh, AI and robotic learning. And uh, what that what I feel extremely excited by is that that will fundamentally change the landscape of human labor. Um, of course, it's a very, very nuanced topic because human labor mm -hmm. is about jobs, is about the livelihood of people. You know, even self-driving car is um, 
driving us, pun intended, into a deeper discussion of you know、uh, job changes of truck drivers and and and、mm -hmm. taxi drivers. But in the meantime, there's just so much、um, productivity to be unleashed in 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 human world that can make work safer. Um, mm -hmm. More efficient and more collaborative, and possibly even break the boundaries of physical distance, thanks to、uh, robots. So I think that the imagination、uh, that that's enabled by、um, the, the the future of robotics is just it does excite me, excite me as a researcher, and it excite me as thinking about what. World we can possibly imagine with the advent of um, um, robots. It also excites me because I think you know, Peter, you and I have a role to play to ensure this will be going to the direction we want it because it's so profound. It impacts people's uh, um, work, people's dignity. People's、mm -hmm. agency that、um, technologists, technologists like us who understand this technology deeply and are making this technology, have a incredibly important role to play with the rest of the society to make sure this will、um, go where we would like it to go. Couldn't agree more, Fefe. And、um, I'm so excited that you're also so excited about you know the potential of. AI in robotics, and that that's going to be really a transformational. I I I expect that too in the next. You know, it's it's starting to happen, and I think it'll it'll a lot more will happen. Wow, we we covered a lot of ground.、Uh, I'm so thankful for having you on, Fefe. I I'm very thankful you invited me. I always love you know talking to you, Peter. <laughs> well, same here. I find it really inspirational, especially all. The background stories that I didn't know about of why and how you got into all the different major major projects you're you're leading, and and of course I, I really hope、um, your mom you know does well because that seems like you know that must be top of your mind at all times from everything you you describe,、yeah. um, and hope we can catch up in person soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. <laughs>